Hi, my name is Fiona Levin Smith with IFS Codings, and today we also have Jason Parton, one of our application engineering managers, to assist us with today's topic. Jason, say hello. Hello, everyone. So today's webinar covers the issues that can arise when applying powder coatings. There's a huge range of things that can go wrong. Even though it seems like such a simple process, things can still go wrong. So today we'll cover some of the most common issues that we see and also the most common things that our technical team get asked about. So we're just gonna look at potential issues with the actual application of powder. We will look at some of the appearance issues that can occur in another webinar. So make sure that you check out that webinar as well. As we all know, powder coating and the application of powder is not an exact science. Though it seems like quite a simple process, especially to those of us who've been doing it for a long time, uh, there's a lot of factors involved, from the powder itself, uh, the various different pieces of equipment, so guns, hoses, valves, ovens, pretreatment uh, pre options, sorry, as well as the application environment itself. We can't possibly cover everything in one short presentation, but we will try and cover some of the more common issues, what causes them, and also how to avoid them. So over to Jason. So one of the first things uh, we're going to talk about would be your our low film build. Uh, if you don't get enough wrap, uh, you know, maybe poor charging, uh, you know, all those things. Uh, when you see low film build, you're going to get this uh, grainy effect or a tight orange peel. I like to call it a pinchy look where the, the powder doesn't flow and it looks real tight. Uh, that's a good way to see that you don't have enough film with most powders. If if you're below a mil and a half, you won't get that nice smooth surface uh, on many colors like yellows, whites, reds. You will also see uh, at that low film build, you can see through to the substrate. So depending on the color, you could see some issues with uh, seeing through the substrate at low film builds. So, you know, one of the main problems with that is uh, is uh, the most common cause is, it, that we see is is poor grounding, uh, and and poor grounding can lead to to not only film build but it can lead lead to uh, you know visible issues along the way. Uh, there are grounding recommendations about made by the NFPA. Uh, those recommendations are based on on not uh, producing a spark, but uh, with that said. We know from an application standpoint, if, if you don't have the proper ground, you will not get the proper charge from the powder. So what happens is you charge, you have the charge coming out of the gun, you have an ungrounded part, that powder will not adhere up to that part. If you have a properly grounded part, that powder will hit that static charge field, go to the part and, and cling there. So, uh, Ground is usually the number one issue. Uh, gun settings, probably the second biggest issue with long film. Uh, it can be a matter of not having enough powder flow coming out of the gun. It can be a matter of having too much powder flow coming out of the gun and your KVs are not set properly or your microamp levels are not set properly. And then probably the other biggest thing that we see on a regular basis is improper application. Uh, some people choose to, to move the gun in a very fast manner, and that does not help the application process whatsoever. It actually hinders the application process. It's much like having a, a uh, ungrounded part. Your powder no longer stays in that charged field, so you're not getting the, the uh, help uh, of, the, of the gun to get the powder onto the part. So for the fix uh, on, on the ground, one of the things we would do, uh, thank you, most job shops will have a, have a earthen ground with a 10 foot rod, you know, driven down into the ground. So, you know, that needs to be measured to see if you have a ground. You, you can measure that with a megameter. Uh, basically you, you hook up a, a meter, one end of the meter to the park, one end of the meter to your booth or to known ground somewhere. And you should be able to shoot the charge through there and get less than one mega ohm resistance in there. If you're not less than one mega ohm resistance, first of all, you've not mess, met the NFPA standard, which means you have a, a risk of a spark there. Uh, it doesn't mean you can't coat, but what it means is you won't coat as efficiently. 
So one of the big things is make sure every place you have a connection in that process from your part to your rack, you have a clean metal spot there from your rack to your hanger or to your hang bar, whatever you have hanging in your booth or, or your outer racks. Everywhere through there needs to be a good, clean metal to metal connection. So the charge, you'll be able to dissipate the charge and have a good ground there. Uh, regular maintenance and cleaning, uh, the routine depends on how much you cope. You know, people with automatic lines probably find that they have to clean racks more often. Uh, in some of the smaller shops where you don't have a high volume going through there, uh, uh, maybe you just have to burn racks weekly or, or bring in a new rack every week or or, or work on the, the contact points every week. So that really depends on what your volume is. We, you need to you know, make sure you don't have buildup on the racks when you can. A lot of people use aluminum foil to cover their racks in certain areas. So the, the area where they're not hanging doesn't get coated. That's a good, that's a good thing to follow. Make sure your electrodes and your guns clean, not wore out, things of that nature. So on your gun settings, the fix, you know, the fix on some of your gun settings, always check your, your tech data sheet and, and see what your powder supplier is asking you to spray at the KV. Uh, you know, most powders, that's probably going to be 70 to, to 90, 70 to 100, somewhere in there for just a normal powder. Uh, I, I prefer spraying metallics at 50 to 60. Uh, so your your technical data sheet should list where that powder will spray the best at. Doesn't mean it won't spray at those settings, just should spray better in that range. Uh, if possible, if you have a KV meter available, you know, check your gun, make sure you're putting out the proper KV levels. We see that quite often. Uh, make sure you're not getting uh, powder back into the controls of your gun. That's one of the things uh, manufacturers don't like you blowing the, the air back into certain parts of the gun, it pushes excess powder back in there and causes uh, causes issue going down the road. You know, make sure the multipliers, comp, cables, pumps, all that, you know, nothing's cracked, broke. Uh, you, you're not standing on gun parts. I see that a lot of times people stand on hoses and wondering why uh, they can't get the proper amount of powder out of there. Sometimes, you know, it's as simple as People will spray too much powder out of the gun, so you're absolutely not getting the proper charge, and you end up, it's not that you can't build film, but you end up wasting product because you're spraying it on the ground. So that kind of, in general, is your, your low film build things to look for. I think the next thing we probably want to talk about is the Faraday cage issue. All right. So what is the Faraday cage? Well, basically, when parts have internal corners or an odd geometry, the powder does not apply evenly or equally due to how the electrostatics travel through the metal. So this is called a Faraday cage. The powder basically is stubborn and it's going to want to pull away from the corners towards the flat areas or the edges. And this, of course, results in areas of, of a surface that are left bare of powder, which is usually the corners or the recesses. And then once cured, it leaves these areas vulnerable to things like corrosion. Now, most of us who work with powder have also will come across the Faraday cage effect at some point. As it turns out, there are several different things that can cause this. So improper grounding, Jason just talked a bunch about that. Um, your gun settings, so too much or even too little powder flow moving through the gun can cause it. Gun to part distance, so being too far away or maybe too close. Um, a poor spray or application pattern, Jason just talked about that a little bit as well. And then actually the powder itself, maybe being too fine or something like that, that can also produce a Faraday cage effect. So most importantly, how can we prevent a Faraday cage effect occurring? Well, let's address powder flow first. If you do not have enough powder coming out of the gun itself, it's going to make it even harder to get the powder into those internal corners. If this is the case, then obviously adjust your flow and increase the amount of powder leaving the gun. Now looking at gun to part distance. The ideal gun to part distance is usually six to 10 inches from the part. Obviously there's gonna be times when the gun distance will have to be closer than that, especially for like hard to get to areas, that type of thing. But generally speaking, we're usually looking at six to 10 inches. Now you need to 
to mind how much time you spend with the gun, especially so with automatic systems and where the gun is positioned with respect to the part itself. You can't just push a part through the application and expect the Faraday cage areas to be filled. And this is also, I suppose, a link in a little way to poor spray, uh, spray patterns. Jason can attest he's seen some wild spray patterns, especially with manual systems. And of course, this affects where the powder goes, but also the gun to par distance is not always uniform as well. So it's kind of a combination of both. And while we're talking about the gun, you also need to keep up your gun maintenance tip can wear out or a clot can form on the end and both issues can spoil how the powder will exit the gun. Now, if the powder itself is too fine, which, which can occur, especially with reclaimed powder, uh, fine powder will not carry a charge as well, meaning the risk of a Faraday cage effect is increased. A quick fix for this is obviously to check your mix of virgin to reclaimed powder. And if need be, you can re reduce the amount of reclaim that's going in there. And if this is a problem that you face regularly, maybe due to the shape of the parts you coat, then a top tip from Jason is to try heating the substrate before you coat it. Believe it or not, this can actually help the powder disperse more evenly into those tough areas. It's going to increase the overall film build and how well the powder grips to the internal corners. However, heating the substrate prior to spraying is difficult, so you need to manage that pretty carefully and maybe better for more experienced, experienced coders. Is there anything you want to add in there, Jason, about that one? Because I know it can be a little bit complicated. Yeah, I, I, we don't like people spraying parts uh, at a high temperature, but but it is much easier to coat into a Faraday area area if you're at you know 120 to 140, maybe even 150 degrees on the part. And and I think most coders that have coated for any time will understand that that it just uh, you get a better attraction from the powder and it and what hits the part uh, sticks there a little little easier so all right okay well let's move on from Faraday cage to back ionization and KV rejection Jason over to you so back ionization and KV rejection or uh, some people use say BI uh, for short but but uh, it's something that everybody sees. We see it on the smallest line we go to. We see it on the biggest automatic lines we go to. It's just, it's part of what we deal with on a daily basis. So the simple fact is each part has a, is capable of taking so much charge. Now that amount depends on a lot of things. It could depend on the part size, shape, uh, amount of square inches. It can depend on how close the gun is. It can depend on how good your ground is. Uh, there is a lot of things that affect that. And simply what happens as you are applying powder, you are sending a charge to that part. If that part reaches its capacity to accept that charge and you continue to apply the charge, at the point of it reaching its capacity, it will simply send those positive ions back to the gun. It will, and, and what happens is it comes right through the coating, you will result in having some people call them stars some people see pinholes sometimes it's just a little different shade in the color especially around the edges of parts but what that is is that is is the positive charge jumping off of the part coming back to the gun and disturbing that surface and once it disturbs that surface most of the time it will not flow out as it goes into the oven and cures so you know, I've heard it called a disturbed looked starring is what we hear a lot of times, but but that is what back ionization is. So so the the true problem is you are you are giving more charge than what that part can handle. Again, it can be it can be from having poor ground and that charge cannot dissipate up through the ground like it needs to. It can be because you simply have coated too much powder on it. You know, you only need to put two to three mils on, but you keep on going and it will eventually meet that capacity and boom, it will shoot it back off there. It can be, we talked about powder being too fine in, in the, one of the previous slides as causing application issues. Poor, fine powder will not take a charge as well as a big powder particle. And, while I stated that, it will also not fluidize as well, which means it will also tend to cause impact fusion more. 
So poor or fine particles are not something we want to deal with on a regular basis. Gun to part distance is a big issue. We'll throw that in the, in the area of KVs and microamps because because they all kind of work together. The closer you are to the part, more likely you are to cause back ionization because you're applying a charge at a faster rate. You're making it pull more microamps because the tip is closer to that grounded part. Sometimes just the, the KV settings being set at 100 versus 80 will be the difference in you back ionizing or not. So sometimes, and we've seen this in some you know, customers that require very smooth finishes, we know that even though you might not see back ionization on a part, having too much KV or having a poor ground will cause you orange peel issues where it's not as smooth as what you want it to. It will actually have a little more orange peel than it should have. And that's because the, the electrical current is, is affecting that coating and you didn't get it to the point where it rejected it, but it, it caused that coating not to smooth out properly in the cure process. The Faraday cage issue is a huge factor uh, when, and that's probably where we see back ionization the most. People try so hard to throw extra powder or get the gun closer to get into that Faraday and then the areas outside or the edges closest to that, they're the path of least resistance. That's where the powder wants to go and it goes there too fast. Then we get the back ionization on those areas. So you, you will normally see it either in a Faraday cage area around the edges of that or just areas that we spray too much powder on uh, is, is the most likely place to see back ionization and, and defects like heavy orange peel. So one of the fixes, and you're probably gonna hear this multiple times throughout our, our webinars, checking for good ground. Good ground is, is, is the most basic and one of the most important items for being able to powder coat not just being able to powder coat, to being able to powder coat efficiently and repetitively. So we use KV settings to, to produce a charge to, to help coat. We also use microamp settings so we don't produce too much charge. Uh, a lot of the new equipment, you can set your microamps at 15 or 20, and once you reach that microamp, it will, it will self-limit itself and bring the KV settings down so you don't overcharge. Uh, you know, the amount of powder flow does matter. If you have an excess amount of powder flow, you're probably not going to KV, KV reject as easy because it is, it is fulfilling that powder cloud out there. Uh, sometimes if you have too little powder and you keep on trying to stick your gun in there and build film, it will cause you, you know, to build on excess on the edges and not get back where you need to be. But the main thing is to lower voltage and and use those microamps to, to, to lower voltage so you're not over applying electricity. Uh, we talk about ideal gun to part distance. On an automatic line, we would like to see, you know, 10 inches, anywhere from eight to 12. A lot of that depends on, on the parts that are going through there how deep those parts are. But, you know, after 12 inches, you start losing a lot of efficiency of the gun. So, so we would like to see that eight, 12 inch mark. You guys spraying manual applications. Uh, most of the time, people are gonna be just a little bit closer. So we, we, we throw that six to 10 inches out there. And then any of you guys that have been coding for a long time, now there's just certain places you, you literally have to stick the gun in there and get very close to get get into that Faraday and, and to cover the things you need to cover. So that's that's back ionization in a nutshell. So I think the next thing we'll talk about is gun spitting surges and, and things of that nature. Okay, so now let's look at the issues around gun spitting, surging, and inconsistent powder feed. I think what they actually are is pretty self-explanatory. The names kind of give them away. So let's jump straight to the causes. Well, one of the most common causes of these issues is improper powder fluidization. What can happen here is when there's too much fluidization going on in the fluidizing hopper, you start to get lots of air bubbles. Uh, this means that the flow coming out of the gun is not a consistent mix of air and powder. Basically, there's going to be too much air. 
So what else can cause surges and spits? Well, buildup on the tip of the gun and on the electrode can cause spits when that residue buildup decides to break off all at once. Also, worn out pumps or venturi tubes can contribute here as well, as can kinks in the hose. And if the hose is really long, that can factor in too, as the longer the hose, the more air, power and powder it needs for a consistent flow. Humidity in water can actually have a negative effect as well. So the humidity levels affect the air in your line and water in the air line will mess everything up, creating impact fusion or powder clumping. All of this causes spitting as the clumps come loose. Essentially, the more moisture in the air, the heavier the powder will become as it pulls the water particles in. Okay, so that's what they are. How do we stop these things happening? Well, as you can imagine, a lot of the solutions are actually pretty self-explanatory. Basically, a regular cleaning and maintenance schedule will really help here, just like it does with everything. As part of the cleaning schedule, remove powder buildup, check your pumps and venturi tubes, and make sure there's no water in the main lines. Also, while you're storing and applying the powder, make sure you maintain a good temperature in the application area, and also watch the humidity levels, because that can really help. When it comes to hoses, there are several things to be aware of. So depending on how new your equipment is, the hose length has probably already been factored, factored in by the manufacturer, uh, as some automatic booths have different settings for each hose depending on how long they are. The best thing to do is to check with your equipment manufacturer what the ideal hose length should be for your particular system. Also, to prevent spits, surges and inconsistent powder feed, check your equipment. Make sure the hoses themselves are not being restricted in any manner. It's also probably worth mentioning that reclaimed powder doesn't act the same as virgin powder. It doesn't fluidize as well as virgin, nor does it travel through hoses or charge as well. And so this makes it more likely to have those, these types of application issues. So judge whether or not the benefits of reclaiming powder outweigh the risks depending on what your job shop and clients require and the type of job that you're doing. Jason, do you want to add anything else to that? Yeah, the, yeah, a couple of things there. We know the longer the hose, the the more air it takes to to push the powder through there, which means the more air, the faster powder is going to be coming out of the gun. So, the the best bet is to run with the shortest hose as possible. Uh, in in the instances where you're running automatic boost, you're always going to have an issue where one side's a little longer than the other. So you'll have to compensate for that in your settings. And then one other thing that that I thought about when we were reading down through there is, you know, too much fluidization causes, we know that causes surges. We also know if the powder doesn't travel through the holes well and settles in the holes, as it builds up, the air will catch it and pick it up and then you will have a significant surge out of that as well. So your air settings to push powder through the holes are very important in, in stopping surges and, and, and spurts as well. Awesome, good tips. All right, well, let's move on from that and let's have a look at the application environment itself. Over so, you. Uh, temperature and humidity, uh, you know, a lot of places don't have a environmental room where they can control their, their temperature and their humidity, but we're gonna discuss why they're important and, and how those things affect uh, application. So, first off, uh, Powder loves humidity. Powder loves moisture. It will absorb it out of your skin. It, uh, when I powder coat stuff and I'm not wearing a mask, it makes my lips chap, uh, makes my nose dry out, my fingers crack, because it is literally absorbing the moisture out of your skin. So if you're in a high moisture area, high humidity area, that powder is absorbing that. And that humidity will make the powder apply better. What happens is you get too much humidity and it causes application issues. We also know with too little humidity, it can not charge as well. So you will lose some film build and things of that nature because you're losing charge because you don't have enough moisture. So having a constant temperature and a constant humidity allows you to have a more repetitive process and so when you're spraying this part one day and the same part the next day you don't have a difference in film build or a difference in uh, uh, orange peel because one day I got four mils on it one day I got two so it's it's more about consistency as, as anything 
And you know, the numbers we always throw out there, the ideal temperature, 70 degrees plus or minus 10. Ideal humidity, 50% relative humidity plus or minus 10. And not only is it important in the application process, it's, it's important in the storage process. Uh, if you don't seal a bag up good and stick it in a 100 degree room with high humidity, I promise you that powder will not apply as well on down the road as it absorbs more and more humidity. So, you know, one of the other things we're going to talk about uh, is reclaim. You know, are you reclaiming powder? Well, uh, a lot of the manual job shops are not reclaiming powder. They're just spraying, spraying the waste. A lot of your automatic lines do reclaim powder. And, and uh, one of the biggest things to watch is to make sure we don't get too much reclaim or we don't build up too much reclaim. As you build up reclaim, your application film build will go down for the simple fact the smaller particles do not take the charge as well. Therefore, they do not uh, charge up to the part and stay on there as well as the big particles. We also know small particles do not flood as well, which means they don't travel through the hose well. And I think I already stated small particles are worse about impact fusion as you travel through the hose. So if you're going to reclaim, my tip is keep as little reclaim in the system as possible. Uh, to do that, that means you don't spray excess powder out of the gun. You make sure you get the powder coming out of the gun onto the part with a good transfer efficiency so you're not building up excess reclaim. Get it pulled back into the system as quickly as possible. I know we talk about different uh, different reclaim ratios. You know, for a normal powder, you might be able to run 50-50 reclaim and uh, virgin powder. For a metallic, you're probably not going to be able to do that. You're probably going to be more in the 80-20. I would say on a normal powder, keep as much reclaim in there as possible, but fully understand that you are going to lose some application issues if you continue to get more reclaim than you do virgin powder. So what else we got is pore spray patterns. So it's a pretty straightforward issue. Uh, it, it, it can be caused mainly by, by poor, poor main maintenance of equipment. Uh, it can just be, it, it can be caused by poor adjustment of equipment. If you turn your powder volume way up and do not have enough air to push that powder through there and atomize it, you will not have a good spray pattern out of the gun. You need a, you need to be able to look through your spray pattern and see an even, even spray pattern from top to bottom. If you have uh, thick areas, we most of us call them fingers or, or something like that at the top edges or in the middle. That means that that when it goes onto the part is going on thicker in that area than it is the two or three inches above there. So you need to adjust that gun, whether it's turn the powder feed down, the powder feed up, the air down, the air up, whatever that adjustment is. So you have a nice good spray pattern. Make sure there's nothing in the tip that's going to alter that straight spray pattern. If you wear out pumps and hoses or, or venturis, you will not get the good spray pattern that you need. Uh, there, there's uh, uh, all kinds of, of wear parts that can cause you to not get good powder feed to the tip of the gun. Some of the fixes, uh, you know, when you're when you're talking about your your parts, your wear parts like your venturis and throats, you know, they make gauges. Uh, you can even, you know, it's a gauge you could make yourself. But we know what size that venturi should be, and we know what size it it, it can wear to. And you simply, you know, make a tool that's that size. If that tool fits in there, then that pump is, that that venturi is wore out. You throw it away and put a new one in there. Again, it doesn't mean that you can't coat with one of those. You will not coat with the same setting with a war part as you will with an, a non-war part. So what happens is you get you get wear, you don't make the adjustment, you get 
defects, whether it's light parts, back ionization, whatever that might be. Uh, I'm a big fan of cleaning parts on a daily basis. Go through the pump, go through the gun, uh, holes that all should be blown out before you start the day. That way, the chances of those be an issue building up there, you've removed that chance by cleaning it from the beginning. All right, so let's, let's have a look at uh, powder sagging then. So, well, what is powder sagging? Well, it's simply when too much powder has been applied to a surface, creating a film so thick that during the cure, it physically sags under its own weight. But this is probably most common when using urethane-based coatings. So you can check out our webinar on the different types of powder products or chemistries um, that, that are available in powder for more information on specifically on urethane-based powders. Now, the problem is in the Faraday cage section, we spoke about how heating a substrate before spraying can help powder apply better. However, if you heat it too much, the powder will melt and flow on contact. And this can even go beyond sagging and become what is called an icicle, a term applied when the coating will actually snap off just like an icicle would. Film thickness also plays a role here. So if you have too much powder built up as it goes through the gel and flow stages, the sheer weight of it all follows the rules of gravity and literally sags. So I guess the good news is that sagging is relatively simple to avoid. Uh, this is when the TDS becomes really important. So keep your film thickness to what the powder supplier and the TDS specify. And if you do have powder sagging issues, you can also reduce the amount of powder coming out of your gun. And if you are heating the substrate prior to coating, don't heat it up too much. So I guess that one's short and sweet and very so let's have a look at poor powder thickness and coverage. Yeah, so film thickness uh, and, and, and the coverage really affects the overall finish in a couple of different ways. We know if you get powder too thick that you will get heavy orange peel. Uh, there's all different levels of orange peel. Some products just have orange peel because they don't flow well. Uh, but we know as you continue to build film, that orange peel will get worse. If you continue to build it to a point uh, that it, it it is able to move, you will get a sag like we just talked about, which will be a you know a, uh, an area that actually starts to move and hang down. So uh, we know if you do not put enough powder on, if it's too thin, that you can see the substrate through the part. This can be as simple as uh, a yellow that looks yellow in one spot and looks greenish in another spot because it does not have enough pigment to hide the substrate where it's light. We can see it with uh, with you guys that do shot blasting. If you're too thin on, on, on your powder and you have a shot blast apart, you're not able to fill in the valleys of the, of the blast profile and therefore you'll see the tip of the blast profile still sticking out and it'll give you most of it call it a blue look or a you know a gray look but it'll it'll darken the look of that color because there's actually substrate showing through there uh you know film build issues can be a, from a lot of reasons you know some of the problems that we see there are are mainly grounding i know we've talked about grounding several times and I will preach on it every time we do a training session. If you don't have good consistent ground, you won't have good consistent film builds and parts coming off the end of the line. It's just as simple as that. Uh, it's not that you can't cope with poor ground, you just can't cope consistently. And I know with most of the shops having to paint things twice or Reblast them and paint them again is a you know it's a huge loss uh, on the pocketbook. So uh, you know the second biggest thing with film build is improper settings. It can be either insufficient KVs where you're not you're not attracting the powder to the part enough, uh, you know, causing you in a low film build. It could be too much KV where you're you're attracting too much and causing the heavy film build all the way up to back ionization. We talked about worn equipment on multiple occasions. It, you know, if the pump and the venturi, if the hose isn't clean, uh, 
or or something in the gun is war, the tip is war, the electrodes war. All those things can and will cause you to have poor application. Uh, we talked, we we briefly talked about him, uh, you know, racks and some of the issues they cause. Improper racking will affect film build greatly. Uh, if you have if you combine your M, your racks with with how far the gun is away from the part and how powder has to get there and and all the different areas of part, you can build a rack where you can't even cope areas of a part. So you really need to take that into mind when you're hanging something on a rack. How is the part? How is the powder going to get to all areas of that part? And can it get to all areas of of, of those parts? We see people put stuff side by side where where the powder can't hardly even get in between the parts to, to get back where it needs to wrap. Uh, I think I mentioned it earlier, gun to part distance. You know, once you get that gun so far away, I think the, the rule is if you hold the gun 10 inches away from the part, you got about a nine inch spray pattern, maybe a 10 inch spray pattern. Well, the farther you get away, the bigger that pattern gets, which also gravity starts taking over uh, powder particles start dropping out and you start losing you start losing part of that powder to the ground instead of to the part. And then, you know, lastly there, powder flow. Uh, there's times you need to turn your powder up to get into Faraday areas, but there's also times you need to turn that powder down and have a nice even pattern so you're not wasting powder, uh, just overflowing it, some of it going to the part, some of it going to the ground. So some of the problems, uh, you know, with part presentation, uh, automatic lines can be really difficult because normally you don't have just one type of part flowing through an automatic line. We have different sizes, different shapes. Uh, sometimes we even have different materials. It's common for us to see people coating aluminum in one process and the next process over is cold road steel or hot road steel or galvanized even stainless steel on some occasions well all those things coat just a little bit different but one of the biggest things is how are your parts oriented you want them you want to try to keep them in a in a fashion so you're you're able to coat all parts as they pass the guns you take into consideration your your faraday areas you know you very many times automatic lines have hand touch up because you cannot necessarily cover a faraday area as it's moving by a set of guns. It really depends on line speed and, and volumes and all that. So, you know, part presentation and how you rack it is a, is a huge concern. So we talked about humidity a little bit earlier. Uh, if you have low humidity, what happens is your powder wants to build a charge as it goes through the hose. Unfortunately, that charge is, a, is the wrong charge. Uh, we want it building a negative charge so it'll go to the to the the grounded part. Well, as a static electricity is a positive charge. So if you're charging it the wrong way as it's going through the hose, then you're losing you're losing application ability once it gets to the gun. So uh, you know something <laughs> something I have done in the past on low humidity days, like those days where you can walk across the carpet and touch something and it shocks you, that means there's no humidity in the air. Low humidity days like that, it was common for us to mop our floors in the in the environmental room, therefore we'd put some humidity in the air. Same thing when we go to California. You know, a lot of the, a lot of the guys out in California have a, have a misting fan in their environmental room because they don't have the humidity that you need to be at 50% to, to help that powder apply. So some of the fixes, uh, I can't preach enough, equipment maintenance and cleaning. Daily basis, you need to go through your, your stuff, make sure it's clean. You know, understand what a war part is, understand what a war venturi or throat is, a war tip. Uh, those things will greatly affect how you apply powder how quickly you apply powder and how efficiently you apply powder. Uh, you guys all know if you've been powder coating at all, uh, powder coating is a great insulator. You'll build it up on a rack and it will continue to build and continue to build and it will insulate that rack from being able to dissipate ground. 
So you always need a metal to metal contact between part, hanger, rack, hook, whatever the term is you want to use. Uh, if you let that powder build up, it will get to the point, especially in a job shop where you're not uh, running on a conveyor or something and don't have time for the part to, to break through that surface, you will have issues coating because you don't have enough ground, which they'll usually come back as back ionization or poor film build or something along that line. And, and you know, there's many times we go to automatic lines, you'll see they'll run the first run through the day on nice clean racks and we'll have three mils of paint. Second time they come around, just a little low, third time to come around, maybe the fourth time we come around, we've lost a half a mil of powder on the same settings, the same rack, the same part. And it will continue to get worse because you're losing the ability to ground that part. When you lose the ability to ground that part, you lose the ability to charge the powder and stick it to that part. So rack design. Uh, a lot of people, when they design racks, they design racks so the hang point is hid. So when I hang this part on it, the chances of powder getting to that point where they're touching is less. That means I can I can paint more before I have to worry about building that rack. Make sure that, you know the the parts are spaced out properly so you can spray in between parts. <coughs> Many of us require you know we let the wrap of the powder get to where it needs to be. And it, something just popped my mind. Wrap. If you don't have the proper settings, if you turn your gun air up too high, you can blow the powder past the part and it won't wrap. So, uh, you know, when you're talking about racks, you need to really understand where the powder's going and how it's gonna get there. So part presentations on can be difficult on automatic lines. Uh, there's a lot of engineering that goes into racks, uh, a lot of thought of, of, of keeping a certain amount of metal in front of the gun so your your transfer efficiency is is as good as it can be and as consistent as it can be uh, a lot of times when we get those odd shaped pieces uh odd shaped parts that are hard to deal that's when we you know we go to a manual gun as well uh, it's very common to have you know 20 automatic guns but for certain parts you've got a guy on each end of the booth you know spraying the hard areas because you, you can't overcome that Faraday or that difficult area, you know, in, in the time the guns, uh, the part goes in front of a set of automatic guns. Always check the powder flow. Always check that gun to part distance. And, you know, understand, understand the, the capabilities of, of the electrostatic equipment. And then, you know, one of the other things we see uh, in, uh, uh, Fiona mentioned a while ago is, is like a foaming. Uh, we've talked about uh, uh, kind of, but in urethane powders, they don't they don't handle thicker film build as well. Uh, a, as you get up in that five, six, seven mils, they have ingredients like ECAP uh, that's part of that resin system that that wants to to come up out of the coating, and as it's coming up out of the coating, is that that coating gets thicker. If, that, that substance gets trapped in there and, and it looks like, uh, I've heard people call it micro pop, people call it a foam look, uh, but that's a, that's a substance trying to escape through the powder, but it's not able to escape because there's too much thickness there. Uh, in the liquid coatings, a lot of people call it solvent pop. It's the same thought is that that solvent's trying to, uh, to uh, get out of that coating as it's being cured and heated and it doesn't have enough time to get out of there. So you, you see the little micro porosity or whatever you want to call it. Another thing I see it in a lot of times and my one of my terms I use is the primid pop. You know, TGIC free polyesters are sometimes called primids. Uh, in that curing process, they, they give off water molecules. As you get that coating thicker and thicker in that six, seven, eight mil range, it's common to see the same effect with TGIC free polyesters with some micro popping or foaming looking areas because that water is trying to escape and there's so much of it and it's so thick, it can't get out before the coating sets up. So 
again, that, that all creates what we call a foaming or a, a pinholing. And it, it normally has to do with, with too much film build in, in that area. Uh, you know, decreasing the film will help that. Sometimes adjusting the oven temperatures, uh, you know, might help that as well. And I think that pretty much covers, you know, some of our, our major defect areas. Absolutely. So I guess to wrap it up, remember that these, these are some of the most common application issues, but there are thousands of combinations of types of powder, equipment, ovens. I mean, the list just goes on and on. So hopefully we've addressed some of the most common issues and the easiest ways to avoid the problems or at least try and fix them if they do occur. Now, don't forget, we also have a range of guides that you can read at ifscoatings.com in the resources section, or you can actually download them as our ebook, which you can also get on the website. So that's just about it. If you do have any questions or queries further to what we discussed today, then feel free to email us. At, it's at coatingsinfo at ifscoatings.com. You can see the email address on the screen there. And we'll make sure that Jason or one of our other technical team members gets back to you as soon as possible. So thanks for attending and look out for another IFS webinar.